Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about a topic that is almost never discussed here in the United States, and that is of kidney stone density. Now, if you've been watching our videos and kind of sequence here, we had a video last week that talked about the different imaging techniques that are available for kidney stones, and we'll link a card up here for this. And in that, we discussed CT scans and their ability to provide kidney stone density information and how critical this is because if we know the density of a stone, we then can interpret that and correlate that to the type of kidney stone that it is and then better align our treatment so that you're less miserable and the stone passes faster and a whole host of other positive things kind of cascade down on that once we have this information. So having stone information is exceptionally important. And this is why, as we discussed in that video from last week, we recommend if this is your first kidney stone, ask the doctor for a CT scan, make sure that you're pointing out that you're wanting to get stone density information as we're gonna talk about here today, because it is so valuable for you, not only just in this current instance of you passing this kidney stone, but if you have future kidney stones, that density information is gonna stay the same. Your kidney stone type that you form is rarely gonna change over your uh, lifetime unless you've made major shifts in your diet or your lifestyle, which most people don't. So it's gonna stay the same. And then that's why we recommend a less, um, potentially harmful imaging modality, like an ultrasound or an x-ray um, that provide no radiation in the term of an ultrasound or low, very low radiation in terms of an x-ray for subsequent or future kidney stones because it will allow you to say, here's where the kidney stone is, this is the size that it is, and you already have that density information which is going to impact your treatment. So you've kind of stacked the deck in your favor and you no longer need to expose yourself to a CT scan which is gonna give you a higher level of radiation than you probably wanna have if you're doing this on a yearly basis like most of us who get kidney stones. So this information is incredibly valuable. So today we're gonna dive in and talk about that CT scan density information that we're able to obtain from that scan. So when we go in for a CT scan, again, we wanna ask for this information because with the sheer amount of people that we talk to that don't have this information, it's likely that it's probably not being done by some of the imaging technicians or maybe it's just not making its way to you but we have to take charge of our health and ask the questions. And again, this is a critically important one to check with your doctor about and chat with them once you have a CT scan. But the information that you're looking for is called a Hounsfield unit. And this was uh, pioneered by someone with the name of Hounsfield. I believe it was sometime in the 40s. But in essence, what he did was put together a radio density scale that was able to assign values to certain objects and densities based on the amount of x-rays that either passed through or were absorbed. And this is pretty smart, <laughs> really kind of genius in the way you think about it. But in essence, let's just take a few examples here. So water was assigned a zero value because it's just passing through it and nothing's really being absorbed. Air is at negative 1000 because again, there's not much here that that x-ray can hit on. And then bone was given a value of 1000 HU. Now, when it comes to any other tissues in our body, like organs or anything else that's in there, they're all gonna be positive values. Now, here's where things get interesting. So when you take a look at a CT scan, and we'll show an image here, it's just basically a black and white image. And to an untrained eye or a non-computerized eye, it's just a black and white photo. <laughs> However, this is where the genius of this system really starts to pick up because in an image, images are made up with pixels. And in that black and white image, there are hundreds of shades of gray. And what this system has done is assigned a value to the shades of gray, which is freaking genius. Now, black is assigned a value of one, white is a value of 256. And again, now can assign density values to basically all those shades of gray and it's interpreted by a computer, which is pretty freaking cool. Now, that's great that we can get that information, but what does it mean for us when it comes to the different types of kidney stones that we form? And that's what we're gonna talk about next. So let's take a look at some different kidney stone types listed out by Hounsfield unit, because 
If we know the density, we now will understand the type of kidney stone and that type of kidney stone structure will dictate, or at least it should, in good urological centers or hospitals, what the correct treatment application should be to be able to help you solve your stone problem. Now, this is not all the different types of kidney stones that are out there. This is just probably the majority of the ones that are formed. And I'd say confidently we're hitting about 95 to 90, uh, 95 to 99% of the kidney stones that are going to be formed in the United States. So chances are your stone falls into this window or is a mix of something. Now, top to bottom, brushite stones are going to be the most dense with a HU value well over a thousand and calcium oxalate monohydrate stones. And there are two different types of calcium oxalate stones. We, we get this a lot. People say, oh, it's a calcium oxalate stone but what type, because there are some critical differences between the two that we'll talk about here. But calcium oxalate monohydrate, this is the most prevalent stone in the United States. And as you can see, it's pretty dense, 879, almost as dense as bone. And these are all average values as well. So it could be higher, could be lower. It just depends upon your individual situation when that stone is forming. Now, carb appetite stones are at 844. And then the rest of these, um, like calcium oxalate dihydrate, which is another type of oxalate stone, these are all kind of below 500. And this is important to notate because I've kind of bracketed these off here because when we have a Hounsfield unit that is less than 500, it means that these stone types are susceptible to something called dissolution. And that's exactly what it sounds like. It's not dissolving, dissolution, dissolving. Now, this will not work for all different types of people. You could have exactly the same type of stone in one person's system and uh, the same type of stone in another person's system and they will not have the same experience. However, for most people, these kidney stone types are able to be attacked with a product like Cleanse that contains antilithics. And antilithics will help break apart kidney stones and help you pass them as either gravel or as sand as we've talked about in one of our previous videos, which we'll link a card to. So this is really good information to know because if I got one of these kidney stone types, you can bet that I'm not gonna work on just passing that whole stone. I'm going to do everything that I can to try to break that apart before it even passes. So maybe I pass it in smaller fragments or even just like sand like particles that I barely feel at all. So this is critical information here. Now, when we think about the different type of, uh, I guess, options that we have for treatment, there are probably four primary. There are what's called uh, expulsive therapy, and there's a medical version of that that's based on pres uh, like pharmaceutical prescription medication. And then there is a natural expulsive therapy, which is a product such as Cleanse that uses herbs and whole foods synergistically to help you pass your kidney stone faster with less pain. But that's one of those options, and we kind of touched on it here with these lesser density stones. The next most popular one is extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, which is also known as ESWL. And this is sound waves that will fracture different types of kidney stones. And density information is super important here because, again, that is a popular treatment option because it's non-invasive. They just blast you with sound waves from the outside to try to break apart the stone. And you walk out the door and you're on your merry way, passing fragments, albeit afterwards, but the stone has generally been broken down in size. But the density will play a role in this because if the stone is too dense, it is not going to be able to be broken apart by those sound waves. Now, there is a little bit of debate about this. When you take a look in the literature, there are some uh, hospitals and research facilities that say a value of 850 or higher, no shockwave lithotripsy. Some places it's a thousand and they'll say no shockwave lithotripsy. So it kind of varies, but based on what we've seen out there, 850 is kind of where we're leaning uh, in terms of uh, efficacy of the shockwave lithotripsy. So that really kind of takes carb appetite, calcium oxalate monohydrate and brushite stones. If you form those types of kidney stones, shockwave lithotripsy is kind of out. So what are we left with then? So the next thing that we're looking at is Basically, it's a ureteroscopy where they are going to go up your urethra with either a basket or a laser, and they're going to try to remove or break apart the stone in that fashion. 
It's a little bit more invasive than Shockwave Lithotripsy, but there are some things that take into consideration with that because it's not, it's probably technically non-invasive because they're not cutting you open, but they are going into you. But with regards to stone density, in that particular procedure, this doesn't play a role. They're gonna be able to go up your urethra and blast apart the stone regardless of the density. But where it does come into play is with percutaneous nephrolithotomy, which is PCNL. And this is where they're gonna cut you open on your side more often than not, closest to the kidney, and they're gonna go in and pull stones out. This is a very popular procedure for struvite and staghorn type of stones that kind of grow into those calyxes, and there's no chance of those passing on their own. But with PCNL, one thing that they have found is with Hounsfield values less than 675, so really we're still talking about this bucket here, those stones are actually too weak to be successfully extracted through this technique. Now, that doesn't mean that all of them can't be removed in that fashion, but if you have a weaker density stone and someone's gonna try to go in there and pull it out, it could break apart and you might end up passing fragments regardless. So these are things that we need to keep in mind. So let's just recap real quick. Stones with densities less than 500 are gonna be great targets for either natural expulsive therapy or medical expulsive therapy because they're gonna be susceptible to dissolution, which means they will break apart upon passing in most instances. So that's these guys. When we're talking about more dense types of stones, stones with a value of 850 plus, just a reminder, extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy that uses the sound waves, not gonna be an option for you here. And then, with these lesser density kidney stones here, again, PCNL, percutaneous nephrolithotomy, going in and cutting you open and pulling the stone out. These are not good fits for this. So again, this is important for you. Your doctor, your urologist, they should know this information. But in today's day and age, we need to be the ones that are taking charge of our health and making sure that we are getting the appropriate treatment. And this information sets you up for success. And as an extra helpful benefit to allow you guys to have something to take with you when you're having that next conversation, we've provided a handy dandy free PDF guide that you can print out, put on your phone, open it up whenever you need to have a conversation about this. But this will be a quick reference guide for you to be able to take a look at this and go, okay, what kind of kidney stone type do I have? Oh yeah, what kind of procedure was I looking to have to get this information? Oh yeah, it was a CT scan and oh great, my stone type was my, or the Hounsfield units on my stone was 550. I might be able to attack that with natural expulsive therapy or medical expulsive therapy. And if your doctor's saying, well, you gotta go and we're gonna cut you open for one of these types of stones, I'd be hitting pause real serious and maybe even thinking about having a second opinion on that particular kidney stone procedure. But nevertheless, you can get the guide to get this information. So go to stone-relief.com slash pages slash stone-density. And again, this will be in the show notes as well for you to click on. And if you're watching this on our actual website itself, there'll be a little button for you to click to get the guide. But this is super important information for you to hang on to because it's gonna change the entire scope of how your kidney stone is treated and how quickly you recover from this. Because based on the lack of density discussions that we have, uh, on a daily basis, really, with people around the country, around the world, this is not being talked about. And I guarantee you that some people are getting different treatment options that aren't the most effective and what's best for them just because they, people don't know. So take charge of your own health with this information to help you with your next kidney stone. We hope you found this information valuable. Uh, as always, please drop any comments or questions in the section below. We do answer all of them. And we look forward to seeing you guys again in the next video. Thank you.